Okay, folks, welcome back. I am very happy that Mother Nature did not throw us a curveball, though it looks like Florida might have, judging by the empty seats. Their loss, your gain. Does anybody know what that is? What is it, I'm sorry? Typhlosion. That is typhlosion. That is the final evolution of Cyndaquil. <laughs> it is the most evolved Pokemon of its kind, executing its most dangerous attack, eruption. I know this because my daughter explained it to me uh, patiently. Um, I had to learn this because Pokemon characters and Pokemon attacks figure prominently in the title story of Zhuzhi Gardner's Better Living Through Plastic Explosives. Western literature does not have many stories that employ Pokemon symbolism. Canadian literature has even fewer. Two that I know of. Um, and they're both in Gigi Gardner's stories. How's the volume, guys? Is that all right? Okay. Um, and that is one reason that I like her stories a great deal. Because they remind us of something that it is easy to forget. Uh, especially in university English classes. Maybe especially in Canada. And that is that short stories can be anything they want to be. A short story can be a letter that a mother writes to her daughter's teacher. A short story can have as many narrators as it wants to. It can even have all those narrators talking at the same time, speaking as a group instead of one narrator. A short story can contain a glossary, like a textbook does, or a dramatis personae, like a play does or footnotes, like an essay does. And a short story can be about whatever it wants to be about. An angry mascot, an angry mascot marmot, a terrorist in group therapy, um, daughters who turn into cranes, angels who inhabit the bodies of high school students. The only rule, I think, is the one that the mother tells her six-year-old daughter's teacher. There are no rules. And that's one reason why defining the genre of the short story is so incredibly hard to do, right? Because if we cannot say what it's not, it's very hard to say what it is. This is uh, Gigi Gardner taking a shot at it. A great short story can achieve the intensity and specificity of language of the best poetry while satisfying our primitive hunger for narrative. It lights the alphabet on fire while taking me on a journey into the human heart, as well as letting the big old world in, rather than pushing it away and diving for cover. What they also have in common is an urgency that you don't often find in novels and nonfiction or even most short stories. She's talking there about some of her own favorite short stories as a reader. Uh, stories by Laurie Moore, uh, George Saunders, Rick Moody, David Foster Wallace, uh, Lee Henderson, Matthew Trafford. Um, but I think it's also fair to take that as her ambitions for her own stories, what she wants them to be and do. So, like Miriam Taves and John K. Sampson, Gigi Gardner, who will be joining us after the break, is also originally from Winnipeg. Um, clearly, this is Winnipeg's year in literature for our time. I did not plan it this way, it just kind of happened. Um, I have no explanation for it. Um, Gardner uh, left Manitoba as a young child uh, with her family and moved to Calgary. She did a degree in political science at the University of Calgary, uh, another in journalism at Carleton in Ottawa, 
and an MFA in creative writing at UBC in Vancouver, where she now lives and has lived for some time. She started writing, uh, as Miriam Taves did, as a journalist, contributing to and working for uh, Saturday Night Magazine, The Globe and Mail, uh, The Georgia Strait in Vancouver, uh, and The Vancouver Sun, among others. She published her first collection of short stories in 1999. It's called All the Anxious Girls on Earth. And it was published by Key Porter here in Toronto, 1999. It got a, a lot of attention for a book of short stories. Um, notice from people I consider to be real writers, um, people like John Metcalf, Barbara Gowdy, and Lynn Crosby. I liked uh, what Quill and Quire said about it in a review. They said, Gardner wears the short story like spandex on a bicycle courier, shiny, black, and slick. There's that sense of urgency, right? Urgency that you can feel in the prose. Partly because she started teaching writing herself afterwards, we waited over 10 years um, for her next book, um, this book, Darwin's Bastards. Um, it is a collection of short stories uh, by other writers that she selected and edited. Um, a collection of speculative fiction, science fiction, astounding tales from tomorrow. And it was published in 2010 by Douglas and McIntyre. May they rest in peace. The stories are uh, mostly by the current generation of Canadian writers. There's a few older hands in here, people like Douglas Copeland, William Gibson, but it's mostly by the next generation. Um, Lee Henderson in Vancouver, Stephen Marsh here in Toronto, Jan Martel, Jessica Grant from Newfoundland, Annabel Leon, Heather O'Neill from Montreal, uh, Pasha Mala. Um, these are all people that I consider to be among the finest the young writers in this country today. And then the first story in the book is set in the future and celebrities have been outlawed, personal fame has been outlawed. So an ethnomusicologist who's a university professor goes on a road trip to, to interview for his academic, or her academic project one of the last surviving rock stars who's now 81 years old and her name is Leslie Feist. That should you know, give you some idea of the content of the book. It is a great deal of fun. Um, if you were thinking of doing something nutty over reading week, like I don't know, reading, um, <laughs> you know, say for pleasure or something, this, this would be a good book to do it with. Um, in 2011, uh, Penguin Canada published um, Juju's second collection of her own stories, and that is the one that we're reading, uh, Better Living Through Plastic Explosives. Um, that's the limited edition dust cover that you don't have on yours. This was, as far as I know, this was only available at the book's launch party in Vancouver. Um, it was, uh, it's by her sister, uh, Mariana Gartner, who's an artist, a painter herself, mostly oil on canvas, some collage. I love her stuff. This is one of her recent ones. This is her take on Little Red Riding Hood. Um, it's kind of got a Victorian flavor to it, kind of steampunky. There's a lot of tattooed babies and some metal body parts and stuff. Um, she's also clearly one of Darwin's bastards. This is called uh, Half Girl with Black Dog, 2012. And I suspect this to me is a lot closer to the sensibility of the stories that you've read than the rather decorous cover uh, with ivy with which Penguin provided the book. In fact, I like a great deal if you can see it, I think the lights are washing me out a little bit here, but you know how her sister has turned the, the lovely green ivy into the veins on the face of the baby. You know, this one strikes me as a lot more Pokemon. <laughs> right? um, as you can see from the red sticker, Better Living Through Plastic Explosives was a finalist for the Giller Prize, which is this country's richest prize for fiction. Of uh, perhaps equal importance, the feminist magazine Bust magazine in New York gave it its highest rating, five boobs. <laughs> Almost all of the stories in uh, Better Living are set in Vancouver uh, in a more or less speculative or fantastic version of the present or the near future. This is not realism, so don't go looking for it and do not judge it by realism standards. Um, if a missing Japanese exchange student shows up on the back of a giant sea turtle, just accept it and move on. Um, 
Gardner says that the most direct relationship between editing Darwin's Bastards and writing the stories in Better Living Through Plastic Explosives is that realism and I have finally parted ways, amicably but irrevocably. Realism and I have finally parted ways. She says that in these stories, in, for example, the mother who objects when her teacher tells her that she must draw her animals with their feet touching the ground. Or the journalism teacher who tells her students, don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. This is not realism. You won't find a lot of um, psychological introspection in these stories, something Canadian fiction is, is rather fond of still. Um, you will find observation, uh, playfulness, um, plot. You will find characters who move around, characters who do things, sometimes even characters who kill people. Just because the stories are not set in the real world does not mean that they're not about the real world. I found myself writing about the future these days because I'm interested in the present. The trouble with the present that greased monkey, that perpetual motion machine, is that it just won't stay put. Let's say I'm trying to pin life in East Vancouver, January 30th, 2012, today, to the mat. By tomorrow, I'll already be writing about the past. So if I want to write about today, I cast it in the guise of the day after tomorrow, or five or 10 years down the road. As William Gibson and other muckers about in future dystopias have put it, all good writing about the future is really about today. She goes on in the same piece to give us examples. She says, there are few better primers on Victorian England's social and political mores than H.G. Wells' The Time Machine and The War of the Worlds, books of and about their time, despite the fact that they're set in a future time. A hundred years from now, I think Better Living Through Plastic Explosives will make a remarkably good primer on our time. I think when our descendants look back at the year 2011 through the lens of these stories, they will see a society that is very worried about its own ending. Assuming we have descendants. Assuming they can read. The Clock on City Hall, in the final story in this collection, the clock on City Hall has four different faces that tell four different times. But by all four clocks, it's getting late, the narrator says. The people in these stories live on cul-de-sacs. They live on dead ends. They live on the edges of ravines. They live on the edge of the continent, the edge of the last continent. They're out of time and they're out of room. Their churches have been turned into performance spaces. Their homes are sliding off the mountains into the sea. There are more homeless and they are more daring. There are wildfires in the mountains, mounds of garbage floating on the waterways spontaneously bursting into fire, toxic spills on the railway. Bears in the city, fire ants in the peonies, and there's a tsunami on the way. People are on the edge in this place. They are angry, they are stressed, they are ready to explode. At the end, one of them does, at the very end. The mother, in Floating Like a Goat, becomes progressively unhinged as she writes the letter to her daughter's teacher. The movie producer and Mr. Kakami is always angry, incessant rage. In the story, investment results may vary. A young woman assaults another woman for using a leaf blower to get rid of two leaves, something I actually understand. <laughs> she says in the moment of doing it, she says, this was the moment she understood how something like Columbine could happen. Somebody is killing motivational speakers. 
the people whose job it is to make us feel happy and hopeful are getting murdered. Someone is leaving body parts in garbage bags on the street. And somebody is killing the peacocks in Stanley Park with a tire iron. When uh, my friend Laura Penny reviewed this book in the Globe and Mail, she got worried. She said, are you left coasters okay? Did all that steroidal Olympic overdevelopment crack some protective subterranean barrier, unleashing forces monstrous and strange? So Laura is a smart woman. She knows this is satire, right? And she is responding in kind. She is responding satirically. She's kidding. And she's not kidding. Welcome to satire. Many things that happen in better living through plastic explosives really did happen in the real Vancouver. Remember what Nabokov said? I always use that word in quote marks. In 1999, a woman really did throw her baby off the Capilano suspension bridge. And the baby really did survive. In 2005, homes really did slide off the North Shore. Not hundreds of them, but you know, enough to be scary. And in 1992, a man beat six pink flamingos to death at the Stanley Park Zoo with a broom handle. That was obviously too unbelievable for fiction, so Juzi settled for a few peacocks with a tire iron. Colonel Mustard with the candlestick in the library. So those things happened, and other things that happened in these stories really happened. They just didn't all happen at the same time. And that tells you something about satire, about how satire works. It exaggerates. It magnifies. It brings things together that actually do happen all the time, and it makes them all happen at once. And that's how you know it's satire. Exaggerated subjects in an exaggerated style. On, uh, on television, or in a play, TV can announce itself, or pardon me, satire can announce itself visually, right? It can provide visual winks to let you know that, hey, this is ironic. On the page, it's harder. It always has been. You have to read at a slant. You have to read things into the words that they're not actually saying, which is not only hard, it's a little perverse when you think about it, right? Irony is a very perverse pleasure. To sit there and say, I'm going to read the words for other than what they actually say. So you know this book is satire because you finished it, or because I just told you, or because you read a review about it. But when you pick the book up, right, when you pick it up, and you don't know anything about it, how do you know that it's satire? If nobody's standing there winking, going, yeah, nice haircut, dude, right? If there's no visual indication of satire, how do you know that you're not supposed to just read this straight? Well, I think the title probably helps. Um, I would sincerely hope that nobody bought this book sincerely. In fact, one of the funniest things you could do, do it tonight, when you leave here, go to chapters, find all the copies of this book in the store and put them in the self-help section. Right? Some readers would even recognize that the title is itself a parody of self-help titles, real self-help titles, like these ones. Better Living Through Science, Better Living Through Economics, Better Living Through Urology, L. Ron Hubbard's Common Sense Guide to Better Living, Better Looking, Better Living, Better Loving, 30 Days to Better Living, and the slightly more demanding 40 days to better living. <laughs> and my personal guide to the good life, the daily ukulele, 365 songs for better living. <laughs> None of those are invented. Um, after you get past the title, inside the book, um, the main or most obvious marker of the satiric is again, excess. Exaggeration, page eight. So the neighbors on the cul-de-sac have invited the flesh eater uh, to a dinner party at their home. 
They're trying to make nice. I'm in the last paragraph on page eight. What felt like light years later, during which Hot Rod, as Stefan dubbed him that night, frequently interrupted the conversation with detailed descriptions of the modifications he'd made to his car. Nokia adjustable shocks, Bruce Herb 1.31 inch anti-sway bar, two inch lowered Simpson Michigan leaf springs, EGR carpet, dynamite insulation, restored dash pad, ultralight automorphic gauges, pain-free wire 16 circuit, 68 to 74 muscle car kit, TPS polygraphite bushings used throughout, including body mounts. WRT Z28 coil springs, Calvert Johnson cow rack traction bars, pause for lubrication. Black 73 interior added years ago, Sony Frost Mark stereo head unit, five times 160 watt amp, and believe you me, a 12 disc multiplay CD changer, two six by nine altitude rear speakers, and PH quartz components in front. He returned bleary eyed from yet another trip to the bathroom and shot dual pistol fingers at each of our wives. Next weekend, I'll make you ladies some real food. Exaggerated subjects in an exaggerated style. And it's the exaggeration, the accumulation, the excess that tells you that it's satire. Irony can be um, just for fun, right? Irony is a technique. It can be just for fun. The sheer perverse pleasure of understanding other than what is said, especially pleasurable and especially perverse when other people don't understand it. The difference between satire and irony is that satire has a point to make. Northrop Frye called satire militant irony, militant irony. Uh, it has targets, satire is a target. This is the first appearance of the title story in uh, the New Quarterly, which is Canada's best fiction magazine. Um, and it's a very apt illustration for the story, a target. That's what satire does. Satire goes after things like unspoken social conventions, beliefs that we have forgotten our beliefs. And we've turned them into rules, um, shared neuroses. Some of the main satiric targets of better living through plastic explosives, or one of the main targets, I should say, is all that apocalyptic anxiety and stress that we went through a little while ago. Um, apparently, the city of Vancouver makes the ideal setting and focus for that anxiety, that satiric target, among others. If you are a Canadian artist with a dystopian vision, the odds are pretty good that you're going to set it in the city of Vancouver, especially if you happen to be an artist who lives in Vancouver. Uh, Douglas Copeland's novels, Jeff Wall's photographs, um, Dan Bijar's Destroyer, an album which you heard a bit of before the class. This is our last album. That's a photo of the Vancouver skyline, looking at the North Shore over downtown, looking north. Um, the album's called Kaput, as in, you know, done for, finished. There are some obvious reasons why Vancouver has always been, a, why Vancouver and dystopias have always gone hand in hand in our art. Um, it's the end of the continent. And historically, it's, it's, it's where colonialism ran out of room, right? It's where the big European fantasy, Hegel's dream, came to an end. No more space. And it's an earthquake waiting to happen. That's got to do something for how you think about it in art. The glaring economic divide of the city. Uh, rich, plastic Vancouver. When, when, when the, the reality show Real Housewives opened up a Canadian franchise, they did not set it in Toronto. They set it in Vancouver. TV always knows. <laughs> I think the real reason is that why there are so many dystopian visions of Vancouver, I think all it is is that, I think all that beauty just makes people uncomfortable. I really do. I think it's along the lines of, you know, we can't possibly deserve this and payback is gonna be a bitch. I think that's a big part of why so many people, and the other way to say this is that, you know, Vancouver is this country's utopia. And so it is of course also our dystopia, because one is the inverse of the other. The stories in Better Living target that 
dystopia mercilessly. It's flora, it's fauna, it's species, and all their varieties. The first story is subtitled, Field Notes on the Tendency of Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type. That's the subtitle of the first story, Field Notes on the Tendency of Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type. And that's kind of what you get in the book that follows. Field Notes on Vancouver Varieties. Like the Greedy Type, page 85. right after the section break. It's about the things you want. Don't let anyone tell you differently. It's about the things you can't have. Is it so terrible to want what you can't have? Can someone tell Nina that? Huh, 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 I'm not gonna keep, it's one of those ones that works on the page, but not out loud. Anyone? That huh echoes not just on those pages, but throughout the book as a whole. You watch over and over again, the characters in this book want the things that they can't have. The type that we used to call yuppies, um, now bougies or boogies, I don't even know how to say that word. How do you say it? Bougies? Am I getting feedback? Yes? yes? If you guys could do anything, about, I don't know, you know, a little bit of feedback. It's when I stand right here, right? Is it coming through in the cameras too? Or just in the house? So you mean they gotta suffer, but posterity's cool? <laughs> I'm okay with that. So, <laughs> so bougie, right? Is that right? You gotta be, have some I never go out, I never talk to people, I just read, you understand? <laughs> you guys are the closest thing I have to a social life. <laughs> so, <laughs> you laugh. <laughs> uh, anyway, yuppies. Um, people who, who plant their lawns with native species of grass, drought-resistant native species of grass, and cut them, if they cut them at all, their lawns with a Lee Valley push mower. Uh, people who not only buy, but speak Ikea. Um, another common variety, uh, men behaving like boys, 40-somethings uh, wearing hoodies, and uh, riding skateboards, wearing SpongeBob, un SpongeBob underwear. Um, in the story, Once We Were Swedes, a 36-year-old woman goes through early menopause while her 43-year-old boyfriend grows peach fuzz and joins a band. That's satire. Um, hipsters, people at the end of taste. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Fig-infused martinis, um, lamb popsicles, uh, DJs dressed like tennis players mixing Harry Belafonte with Trooper, people who wear ironically short terry cloth shorts to a party, this one in Toronto, and then complain when some guys can't see the irony for the shorts. Page 10. Uh, right after the section break. We found his backyard well-kept, albeit oddly quaint. Holly hobby chic, Stefan called it. Garden gnome stood here and there, gnomically, Patel later said, as if reciting a Zen cone rather than a bad pun, amongst towering delphiniums and various mullanes. Surely the Wong Campos couldn't have left those, these things but it was even more inconceivable that they belonged to him. It now seemed laughable that we wasted so much time over the following week debating the question of whether he had bought all this in earnest or whether he had an understanding of its quiche value. Right? So you understand what he's saying. They've gone over to the guy's backyard and there's a bunch of those you know, garden gnomes. And the whole debate is, are those sincere or are they ironic? Because if they're ironic, you're allowed to have them there. But if they're sincere, you're not. Right? That would be a faux pas. That would be bad taste. They do the same thing. They have the same argument over his haircut. They can't decide if his haircut is hockey hair or ironic hockey hair. That type. The stories in Better Living are deeply ironic in multiple ways. 
but they are also, I believe, products of David Foster Wallace's anti-ironic literary rebellion. And I say that because one of the most persistent targets of the irony in this book is irony. That's one of the main and recurring targets of its satire, is irony. The trendy, the unreal, spectacle, performance, churches that have become performance spaces, movies that have become films, facts in journalism that have become opinions, and short shorts that have become statements. Page 28. It was the year, right at the section break, it was the year provincial health insurance had started covering Botox injections and teeth whitening technology for the disenfranchised. 33 year old female heroin addicts who had appeared 60 now looked like ageless fireball XL5 puppet people. They jittered around expressionless, eyes wide, the remaining teeth gleaming like chiclets between pillowy Jolie lips, tritium. Buildings were crumbling. Major developments sat abandoned, skeletal. Steel girders pointed skyward with nothing cloaking them. But the people who squatted amongst them looked defiantly better. So Botox and teeth whitening for the homeless, but not homes. Appearances over realities. Performance. Uh, Better Living Through Plastic Explosives doesn't employ um, the particular streak of irony that we came to call postmodern irony, or what some call blank irony. And you, you know blank irony when you can't tell where the person's true beliefs fall. Blank irony is irony that is never sincere, that is never stable, that never settles, that never believes in anything. The irony in this book is the irony of the satirist. And the satirist attacks out of love. Gardner is generally successful in this book at hiding how much she actually cares. Um, and I think a lot of that comes from, that ability to hide, comes from the scientific voice, the objective observer who pretends to be just taking notes in the field. And that objectivity, that voice, has fooled a few readers. Um, some of her narrators, some of the narrators in these stories, do aspire to exactly that objectivity, that kind of clinical detachment. The men, for example, who narrate the first story, Summer the Flesh Eater, they say, people have driven themselves insane for millennia trying to figure out what it all means. Most often, things just are. That's what they say. The angels who come and inhabit teenage bodies and we come in peace, they say that they transcend good or bad. They say we simply are. Those narrators are themselves a target of the satire, of a society that has come to believe that appearances are equal to values. Right? They're part of the joke. I don't think the author thinks that, or what we can perhaps more safely call and do in English the implied author. And that's something equivalent to the hand that you can feel on the curtain. Page 90. This is the story about the collection of families on another cul-de-sac that have all adopted daughters from China and very much want to raise them in the Chinese tradition even though their daughters prefer otherwise. Um, second paragraph on page 90. We found it touching at first how Jing Li's parents offered a wealth of detail about the circumstances of her abandonment. Wrapped in elephant leaf tarot and left by an irrigation canal in the Pearl River Delta, water buffalo in a neighboring field looking as if they were standing guard and a legible note pinned to her diaper. But as our formerly quiet street swelled with the sounds of cooing and crying, the oft-repeated stories became overwhelming, like some life-sized game of clue run amok. 
Xin Quan by a freeway bundled in a pair of worn blue work pants. Fang Yin on a bench in a moonlit park, clutching the stub of a movie ticket, flash dance. Li Wei at a railroad station teething on a wizened yam. It was as if where they were found explained who they were, as if looking back was more important than looking forward, as if there was something intrinsically romantic rather than profoundly disturbing about a baby found at an open air market in a cardboard box amidst a pile of pole beans or winter melons. There's a moral judgment an assessment being offered there that you should hear in the as-ifs, in the profoundly disturbing. And that is the voice of the implied author, hiding in plain sight. It is a voice that often comes out of hiding at the ends of stories, exactly where there is historically, maybe genetically, the most pressure on narratives to provide a moral to say, you know, why the experience of reading this story mattered. The same kind of pressure that Humbert felt, that Nomi Nichol felt, even if the moral is only that there is no moral. Here, the voice at the end of the story, we come in peace, that says the taste of humanity eludes us still. Once you learn to recognize the voice, it's not that hard to hear, and you can infer it when you can't hear it. Page 43. First paragraph on page 43. It was the year the enterprising homeless constructed ad hoc villages of tidy huts from purloined election signs. The colorful little houses lined the cut at both ends of the Terminal Street Bridge. The design world took notice, with the San Francisco-based architectural magazine Dwell running a photo essay with text by Toronto's latest public intellectual, ouch. These intelligent spaces represent design that fully integrates the residents' ideals and values with their needs. Like the yurt and the Quonset hut, the signage home, or Saiho, will no doubt evolve well beyond its origins, co-opted by those with a discerning eye for the frugality and transportality of the design. He supplied the requisite Walter Benjamin quote from the work of art of the age of mechanical reproduction and ended with some McLuhan-esque wordplay. Now, there's no explicit judgment anywhere in that paragraph, with the possible exception of the shot at the requisite Benjamin quote. But I don't think it's hard for you to guess where Gardner stands, where she thinks about what she thinks about homeless shelters being built from election signs. You know, the irony of that. Or architects and intellectuals who think that they're cool. The most intelligent piece of criticism that I have seen on this book so far was uh, a review by Jeet here in the National Post. This is part of what he said. One way of defining Susie Gardner and explaining the novelty and force of her work is to say that she is the anti-Monroe. This is not a question of literary quality as of basic worldview. Pure nature does not exist in Gardner's fiction. Her characters are immersed in a completely technological environment, surrounded all their lives by a digital sensorium. When Gardner's people encounter nature, they see it through the prism of the man-made world. So he is, of course, comparing Gigi Gardner here to Alice Munro, widely considered to be the, the best short story writer this country has ever produced. Uh, he says, here's argument is that Monroe was born into a world in which nature still existed, and that she therefore draws the bulk of her metaphors and comparisons from the natural world, all of which is true. He says further that Zuzia Gardner writes in a world in which we have come to experience nature through the man-made, through senses that have been fully technologized. You watch. He's right about that too. Now, Gartner is not herself especially digital. In fact, she's in the middle of a year-long project in which she has gone um, completely analog. Uh, no cell phone, no internet, no computer. 
I'm not pointing that out in order to disagree with Jude here. In fact, I would say that what he sees is a measure of Gartner's ability to create a world that is not hers, not entirely. She made stuff up, imagine that. Where I do disagree, where I think he's got a little bit wrong, is that nature is not absent from these stories. It's just that nature is something in these stories that we can't hear through our headphones, that we can't see through our tinted thermal windows of our condos, that we can't smell through the smog of the toxic leaks. Nature's there. You watch when you read them. Nature is there in these stories. And she's kind of angry. The mountains that shake the houses off their shoulders. The forest that swallows Patrick Kakami. The rainforest that swallows the movie director in a retake of Apocalypse Now. The woodpecker pecking away at a dead Douglas fir in When We Come in Peace, laughing maniacally. Nature's there, and it's on edge. In an interview with the walrus, um, Juju Gardner said, maybe it's not clear from the stories, but my biggest fears are for the environment, the planet as a whole, and our souls. I think that it is clear from the stories, and I think that's what makes them of our time. Um, let's take a break there. And when we come back, uh, Shishi Gardner will join us.